All right, guys, I paused watching race cars for this, so let's get going. <laughs> And welcome to another episode of Midlight Crisis, a real podcast hosted by three grown-up biologists revisiting books from our teens, and it's totally cool. I am Sophie, one of your hosts, but today I have a randomly generated fantasy name, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think it means I'm in charge of the podcast because oh. of the name. My name is Lorbel Time Emperor. Whoa. <laughs> I'm emperor of all time. Holy shit. You're the next MCU villain. Yeah. 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 Aren't I in the new Doctor Strange movie, probably? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, probably. I just like the first name Lorbel. <laughs> Lorbel. <laughs> it's L A U R B L E. Lorbel. 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 <laughs> anyway, who are you guys? <laughs> Oh yeah, I am Sam. But today in Fantasyland, you can call me Coopoly <laughs> Sister Bender. Oh my goodness! Oh whoa, whoa. Coopoly is amazing. I love that. Are you like Greek? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Coopoly yeah. Sister Bender. Sister Bender is something. <laughs> Sister Bender. <laughs> oh, what a good generator. <laughs> <laughs> some good stuff well i'm also here and my name is hannah but for the purposes of today's podcast you can call me by my name which surely is not at all indicative of my profession it is garkey top guard oh what garkey 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 top guard top i'm the best guard. at guarding the keys <laughs> Uh-huh. To the top? To the, you're I'm, the top guard. I'm the top at, guard. Yeah. Gar. I top guard the gar keys Rar. at the top. Wait. The keys to the gar? The fish? Yeah. Oh. That's exciting. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't know you needed a key to access the gar. These are uh, sci-fi fantasy gar. Oh. Mecha gar? Mecha gar key. Mecha gar key. Go Mecha gar key top guard. There That's we go. That's me. Is guard spelled G-A-R-D? No. Or guard. <laughs> like guard. <laughs> guard. Got it. Gar key top guard. We pronounce words the way they're supposed to be pronounced. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, because we speak English. <laughs> Every time. Well, now that we've all been introduced <laughs> very well and with no asides. Nope, none. Let's talk about the chapters we read this week, which were two chapters from Aragon. Chapter 31 and 32. If you guys want to take it away. <laughs> if I have to. Yeah. So chapter you do. You signed a contract. <laughs> Thirty one. <laughs> I did no such thing. <laughs> a master of blade. As the chapter title suggests, Aragon becomes a master of the blade. And that's that's it. Go Aragon. Yay. Uh, <laughs> So not much else happens except Sephira and Aragon go for some swimmies and Brom <laughs> gives Aragon some advice now on magic fighting. So Ooh. instead of their normal just sword fighting, they're going to be working on magic fighting too, I guess, going forward. And uh, that's really it. So Hell yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A little lackluster. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. Stop me if you've heard that before. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm shocked. I there's one part we'll get into later. I was reading it and I was like, Hannah's gonna be like losing her <laughs> shit at this. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I'm a basic <laughs> what can I say? Uh, <laughs> anyway, we can drag me later. Let's talk about the Myers of Dress Leona, which is yeah. a very short chapter that mostly seems to exist as an introduction to the city of Dress Leona. Uh, after days spent traveling along the shore of Leona Lake, they arrive at the city, which employs many classic tropes to basically give the idea that this place is gross and creepy. <laughs> it was built around Hellgrind, 
which we and Aragon finally learn is an unusual mountain of bare rocks and vertical edges, and which the locals worship in some gross and creepy ways. Aragon, unsurprisingly, finds this place very gross and creepy, so before <laughs> going to bed, he and Brom go and get drunk. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's Accurate. It. <laughs> of some good times. Yep. I don't think Sam mentioned this, but at the very, very beginning of the first chapter, Aragon talks about his like vision. Yes. Oh, and beautiful woman. Yeah, I forgot no, about it's, that. It's like super short, but like mm-hmm. <laughs> I just loved that he says to Brom, like Brom's <laughs> like, "Oh, tell me more about this weird scrying that doesn't follow the rules of magic," and he's just like, "I couldn't see her face, but I could tell she was beautiful." Oh it's God. like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just also Aragon's like couldn't see her face at all but i knew she was hot she was super hot <laughs> but like also the fact that he's so blinded by this like beauty and lust over this girl that he's kind of semi-seriously wants to go yeah. look at every prison <laughs> for her yeah like yeah that's like, such like, a 15 hey, year old dude thing <laughs> right? to want to do <laughs> we can break into every prison and dungeon along the way right no Duh. Of course. Yeah, obviously. It's very important. <laughs> I mean, once again, uh, Aragon unexpectedly parallels Twilight and that the teenager has suddenly gotten r- real horny for no reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's just like, oh, th- I saw a pretty person and that's all I'm going to think about for the rest of my life. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Good stuff. It's just a fun time. Also, Brom says, like, oh, yeah, A, like, A, he says that this dream doesn't really follow the rules of magic. Yeah. But since Aragon was then able to scry her, it implies that, like, she is real and she does exist. So it's weird that he was able to dream about her. And then he says, like, yeah, but sometimes your dreams can touch on the spirit realm. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> Brom? <laughs> yeah, Brom? also... No further elaboration. He just yeah. leaves it at that. <laughs> Maybe there's a spirit realm? realm. Are there ghosts? Are there ghosts? Do you mean the dead? Like, is that like <laughs> heaven? Or like, is it like the ethereal plane? Yeah. It's like, what does that mean? Yeah, this whole conversation is kind of odd because it's mostly Brahm saying what, things like, well, that shouldn't be possible. And then they just move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brahm's like, oh, well. <laughs> Like what? Huh, interesting. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Back to sword cool. fighting. <laughs> yeah. I totally called it that Aragon uh-huh. was going to have to learn how to fight. Yeah. I think we all yeah. did, but I feel yeah, he left handed. Like, yeah. yeah. Aragon had to learn how to fight with his left hand and now he's great with both. Yeah. Yep. Very princess bride. I am yeah. not left handed. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure that'll come up later. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Also, again, they just, like, casually cross the spine again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, and nothing no, Like, NBD. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the, I sort of expected there to be more, like, whenever I read a fantasy novel, there isn't really a travel period that significant that isn't touched on at all. It's just like, yeah, it's been weeks. We crossed the spine. Anyway, we're doing some other stuff now. <laughs> it's like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> huh? Yeah, like you've mentioned in previous episodes, it is odd that at the beginning of the book they hyped up the spine so much as this, like, mysterious, dangerous mountain range that nobody goes into except Aragon. And now they have gone across it twice with no events. Yeah. Like, even just being like, ooh, like, the eerie atmosphere seemed to, like, you know, like, anything like that would have been... Or even, like, I don't know... Saphira is unsettled because she's not used to like the atmosphere of the spine although I guess she grew up there but like Aragon commenting about how it feels familiar even though they're like farther away from home than they've ever been now that they're back in the spine or something like that yeah because I feel like like I don't know it, it feels like they're gonna go back to the spine for something important at some point you know it does yeah, yeah. like because it's like a magical mountain range and forest it's always like oh well they're gonna have to go back there you know like, it's not, yeah. good, right? Surely they're not just going to be like, and the spine, it's mysterious and magical. Anyway, we're done with it. Bye. <laughs> the number of times it co- it has come up makes it feel important. Yeah. So, But yeah. for what? Yeah. yeah. It also just, yeah, it's just kind of strange that, like, 
Christopher Paolini like made this map you know he made where mm-hmm. everything goes and so it just seems weird that like he would have them just going all over the place <laughs> like <laughs> first they go here then they go all the way over there then they go all the way over there and it's like yeah well, you know <laughs> I mean again he was 15 when he wrote this he probably thought that was very plausible yeah I mean the time frame seems right yeah it's yeah. spring now I'm pretty yeah. sure it was, like, early winter when the book yeah. started. Yeah, also Aragon becoming a master of the blade in... In, like, one chapter. <laughs> six months? Yeah. Four months? <laughs> it's been, yeah. like, a season, so, like, four yeah. months? Ish? <laughs> Ish? I-, I was, at one point, trying to keep track of, like, how old Saphir was, but I gave that up several chapters ago, because it keeps doing things like, oh, they did this for days, and, like, they did this for weeks. It's like, how many? <laughs> yeah. But now that it's spring. <laughs> right? Now that it's spring. Yeah. It, I feel like they left right at the tail end of fall. Yes. Like it was already snowing and everything. Wasn't wasn't it like the first snow or did I make oh, that yeah. up? Yeah. No, that makes sense. But yeah, it was like right there. Yeah. So at most five months, right? <laughs> Yeah. Listen, we're in Canada. It could we're, be. Yeah. Easy. It could. <laughs> <laughs> the time between first snowfall and like first signs of spring can be anywhere from like three to seven months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depending on where you're at. <laughs> oh, but yeah, yeah five okay. seems like a good place to, <laughs> yeah. to hang out. Yeah. I'm assuming that's what Europe is like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, he's American, so he's probably got an American bias. And by he, I mean Paulini, not Aragon. <laughs> I was like, Aragon? <laughs> the sequel to this book is called Ur American. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. no. Uh, I mean, Brom does say that Aragon is a talented and rare swordsman, because obviously he is. Obviously. So he probably learned quickly yeah. to master the sword. And I guess it's not like they're doing anything else. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if he's doing it every day, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like he's only doing it every day for like an hour, you know? Uh, Yeah, it doesn't seem like they're doing it for very long. It also doesn't seem like they're doing much, like, other conditioning. Yeah, like just sword fighting. I mean, I guess riding Sephira is probably a workout. Yeah, true. And even riding horses does a lot for your, like, thighs, doesn't it? Yeah. You got a post and shit. So, yeah. He's not. I rode a horse once. (laughs) Doing push ups, though. (laughs) No, he's not like doing a bunch of crunches. But I guess Aragon was probably already like, you know, he was hunting and running around through the spine. That's true. Functional fitness. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess they're still like hunting and walking and riding all day, every day. Yeah. Probably in pretty good shape. And his whole body did get hard. As you Why? as you will recall. Why? As you will He's recall. So nonchalantly too. I don't think about that at all. I no. Well anyway, uh anyway. Ron is very impressed with Aragon's sword fighting skills. Aragon beats him literally for the first time without resorting to trickery, and Brahm is like, There is no more I can teach you now. It's like really Which like it sort of seems like there should be. There, sh- but, there should be a lot. The practice part is more important. <laughs> yeah. If you defeat somebody once, like, that's pretty cool. But can you do it consistently? Like, yeah. if you beat Brahm every time, then that seems the appropriate time to say, I can teach you nothing more of the sword. Yeah. Like, yep. maybe Brahm is having a bad day, you know? Yeah. Or he's, like, injured from fighting Urgles. I just like that Brahm has just, like, fully... Like, I guess it's been weeks, but he was, like, so pissed at Aragon in the previous chapter. <laughs> and then now yeah. he's just like, so anyway, tell me about your scrying. Mm, cool. Wow. You're really good at swords. <laughs> Classic. Nah, he's so proud on. of his son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's doing great. Look, uh, look at my boy. <laughs> he learned how to fight me with a sword. <laughs> doing such a good job. It seems like one of the first times that Brahm is like fully satisfied with Aragon's progress. At first, it's like a nice, like, oh, this is, you know, a nice scene. Brahm is 
proud of where Aragon's gotten to. The student has finally beat the master or whatever. And then he immediately is like, and if you ever fight an elf or a Razak, expect to lose. They're all better <laughs> <Yeah>. than you. <laughs> it's like, oh, right. Okay, sorry. We couldn't let that moment linger for too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, anyone who's magic, just don't even bother. I've been teaching yeah. you sword fighting for regular people, which... Like, is Aragon going to fight against many regular people? No, <laughs> they're Probably all going to be magic, I'm guessing. Yeah, they're all going to be magic. <laughs> I guess we technically haven't seen an elf yet, so, like, there could not be any elves at all, but... um, Yeah. That would be a buckwild setup in this book if <laughs> yeah, an elf yeah. just never showed up. <laughs> yeah, just, there's no elves. We'll never see an elf. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, cool, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that no okay <laughs> yeah it's interesting that part they like because brahm seems to specify that there's a difference between people who can do magic and creatures mm -hmm. who are magic yeah and yes. that he confirms that like dragons are creatures of magic so all he says is that like they are many times stronger than nature intended yeah but <laughs> I don't know. So it's like, are humans the only ones that aren't magic? <laughs> I mean, yes. like dwarves, probably. I mean, I don't know. I guess we haven't magic? seen a dwarf yet. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, if he's following Lord of the Rings lore, I don't think dwarves really have magic. They just have like a really good affinity for mining and metal yeah. work and stuff. They're just real tough little guys. Yeah. yeah but they're also usually really long lived, so I wonder yeah. if they're gonna That's a good point. Make that a thing for magic. Maybe. Maybe. I don't even know. I mean I don't think Christopher Pellini is gonna science the immortality thing uh, for us, I think. Uh, that's just gonna be a magic. It's not gonna talk right. about was it telomeres, just don't yeah. degrade. Yeah. So yeah. You know. <laughs> Elves with their magical self-repairing DNA. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad that we don't have to um, science it again. <laughs> we yeah. already we did, did it, it once. for the Twilight. We already Empire. did it. <laughs> the same thing applies, but magic. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, I did like that Brom in this part is like kind of explaining how to do a magic fight. Yeah, <laughs> but like not really. It's Don't a you very... mean a wizard's duel? Oh yeah, sorry, a wizard's duel. <laughs> and it's just very confusing because as far as I can tell, the rules are D&D &D 5e rules where if the person attacking succeeds on their roll to cast a spell on you, it's going to hit you no matter what, but you do get a reaction. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I didn't like, even think of that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it seems to imply that, like, a person will cast a spell and it will hit no matter what, but you do have a chance to do something. Mm -hmm. But, like, it doesn't seem that you can protect yourself. <laughs> yeah, the premise seems to be because people who fight with magic are usually so good at magic. That if you don't follow the rules, which I'm sure we'll get to in a minute, both people will end up dead almost every time. Yeah. Which is very interesting, honestly. Yeah, because, like, I don't even know how the rules help. Because the rules are, like, you can't attack until someone breaks into the other one's mind. I guess it's if you want a chance at survival... You have to be the one who knows what the other person is going to do. So there's no point in just straight up attacking because the other person will kill you as you kill them. Oh, mm. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can like see a spell coming and fire off a spell of your own and then you both die. <laughs> right. Okay. I actually thought the highly ritualized nature of the wizard's duel as presented here was really interesting because it kind of aligns well I think it aligns really well with a lot of fights between animals because like humans are kind of I don't know wantonly violent because there's fewer <laughs> rep repercussions for us since we're not predators if we get injured 
we're not immediately going to die or like slowly starve to death or something like that yeah yeah so like in nature when you see all those like crazy uh videos of like bucks fighting in the woods or like bears fighting or whatever there's always like a very stereotyped ritual that precedes a fight and most of the time an animal fight ends before it gets to an actual physical confrontation because say it with me it's very energetically expensive and very dangerous (laughs) to get in a fight with a conspecific and this feels like the same kind of thing like it's so dangerous to get into a fight with someone who's as proficient in magic as you are that it's better to not even get to that point and like try to break the other person down first i thought that was really interesting yeah no that that is interesting i hadn't even thought of it like that yeah Although Mm -hmm. in nature, it is always the herbivores or omnivores that are way more terrifying than predators. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like if you see predators fighting, you know that like something, some real has gone down because predators do not fight. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No predator is going to fight unless they absolutely have to. It's mating season. That's the only reason. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's interesting. But well, because it just seems like. By framing it as, like, a rule almost doesn't make sense to me because, like, well, then why would Galvatorix, like, follow the rules, you know? Yeah, I don't think it's a rule as much as, like, it's illegal to not fight this way. I think it's a rule because if you don't do it, you're gonna die. Yeah. So, like, if you want to have a chance at survival, you have to follow this rule. Yeah, it, it's just, exactly. It's, like, con- it's the way he words it, though. Yeah. It's, like... There are strict rules that each side must observe. And it's like, that's not like if it was like the method to starting a fight is this so that you don't Mm -hmm. die. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of being like the the rules, follow the The rules. rules. Yes. (laughs) But yeah, I I guess I don't know as much about people duels as animal duels, but wasn't that a thing back in like ye olden times? When if someone offended you, you would like throw your glove at them and then you would have a duel with guns. <laughs> yeah. And there were a bunch of rules thing. to go with it. Yes. The only thing I know about this is um what I learned from the musical Hamilton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, as we all know, is an accurate historical resource. Yeah. I mean, again though, why would the quote unquote bad guys follow the rules? Follow yeah. rules. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. That makes yeah. more sense now that you said that it's like a rule in the way not to die and not a <laughs> follow the, them. the magic police aren't going to come yeah. and arrest you if you don't follow the rules you'll just the be wizard dead. police are coming for you <laughs> hello it's the wizard police hello, it's the wizard police <laughs> get in my magical cop car <laughs> wizard time anyway <laughs> we missed the most important part about this chapter oh my god yes read. we did <laughs> yeah which is where aragon and Sephira go swimming <laughs> Yes. A, Safira can swim. <laughs> yeah, really well, apparently. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. super well. Not only does she jump in the water, she like swims around, dives down below the water, and then even after Aragon leaves, she just like dips in and out of the water for fun. Yep. Like a lot of swimming. <laughs> yeah, not like a swimming out of survival, like a swimming out of enjoyment. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that really struck me, I guess mechanically, about this scene is that Safira swims with her feet and uses her tail to steer, which is the complete opposite of, to my knowledge, every extant swimming reptile. They all use their tails to swim, like marine iguanas. I mean, there's not that many aquatic reptiles, or marine reptiles at least, to begin with. But, like, marine iguanas swim with their tails. Like, crocodilians swim with their tails. Turtles swim with their feet, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. I sort of saw it as she used her feet to, like, get to the surface. But then after that, it said that she, like, slithered across the lake and moved like an eel. Yeah. Which so is sort of, with a tail. <laughs> yeah, and so I sort of thought that maybe, like, to go forward, she used her tail, but she didn't have a way of, like, angling herself in the water, maybe, to go up oh. and down as easily. So she used her feet for that? Not, like, her wings or her head? 
Well, like to kick up to the surface. To kick up? Yeah. Hmm. But would mem- membrane wings even be able to do anything in water? Like, wouldn't she have to just keep them close to her? I would assume that she had to have yeah. them tucked in the whole time, yeah. Yeah, because, like, I just assumed, like, the friction from the water would just, like, tear them apart. <laughs> <laughs> or she just yeah. wouldn't move. She, yeah. yeah, she would just like, stall out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is weird, because every other part makes it seem like she swims like a, any other reptile. But then yeah. it says, like, she used her feet to kick up to the surface. Yeah. Like, Maybe they were on the bottom? And she kicked off the bottom? Yeah. Although I don't think that's what happened. No. Aragorn's eardrums would have been destroyed. <laughs> well, it depends on how deep this lake is. They were, like, near shore, so it was probably pretty shallow still. But then, hopefully. How big is Sephira? <laughs> I'm just trying to, like... Don't go there. <laughs> we don't know how big Sephira is. That's fine. She's big. Aragorn's ears probably weren't destroyed because he didn't say they were. Mm. It's my rationale. Yep. But does Peloni know that like if you go Peloni. past probably about Peloni? Peloni? <laughs> does Peloni? Pel- I know. How do I say his name? Peloni? Isn't it Paulini? Yeah, Paulini. <laughs> I like Peloni. Peloni. <laughs> What? Uh, Poloni. Poloni. <laughs> Chris Poloni. <laughs> so, so our, our buddy Chris, uh, our buddy Chris Poloni is probably not a scuba diver, and therefore doesn't know how depth can affect your ears. But also, no, who knows how deep they went? Yeah. Just a, a fun fact for everyone is Ooh. the greatest amount of pressure change happens between zero and 15 feet of water. So if he's going deeper than 15 feet, his eardrums were definitely like not good. I mean, he could equalize. You don't need to be able to breathe to equalize. Would he know to do that? I think it's pretty instinctive for a lot of people. Is I mean, it? Like if you dive into the water, like if you dive into deep water... Yeah. You don't immediately break all your eardrums, right? Yeah, if you dive into deep water, you don't feel it. But again, when you're diving into deep water, the deepest you can, like, go without, like, forcing yourself to go further is, like, only five feet or so, right? Okay. So it's, like, even if you're doing, like, a deep dive or whatever, you're not... The the deepest you're going, you would still feel it, but it wouldn't be inherently bad. But, like, if Saphir is taking... Aragon to like the bottom of this lake we're assuming it's deeper than five feet because they're submerged and so Aragon himself is at least what like five eight to six feet tall Saphira has to be what another (laughs) sorry I thought you meant Aragon himself was eight feet tall and I was like what the I said five (laughs) eight didn't I did it cut out yeah oh I I heard five I heard five eight I heard it as like five comma eight feet tall and I was like what do you mean feet tall okay i get it no. <laughs> five eight to six Aragon's feet about tall he's about eight feet tall <laughs> yeah so we know it has to be deeper than that but then Safira adds like if she's i guess how tall she is standing she'd have to be another like what she has to be more than like six feet i'm assuming or else she's tiny yeah so yeah, we're deducing knows. the lake has to be like at least 10 feet deep and if they're like fully submerged to the point where it takes them a little bit to get back up I'm saying the lake is at least 20 to 25 feet deep. So if they're at the bottom, Aragon's eardrums are not okay. I mean, I like like, free dive when we worked at an aquarium together. It was like regularly free diving an exhibit that was, I guess, not regularly. And uh, if my boss is listening, no, I didn't. Um, But an exhibit (laughs) that was, I think, 16 feet deep and my ears were fine. Then you are, you are special. (laughs) Like, or my ears are just sensitive now. I don't know. When I was probably around 15 or 16, I lived on a river mm. and there was like a, it was like the, from, there was a river, the river shore. And then off of it was like this little island where there was like a summer camp that I went to and there was a dock that connected them. And we would regularly like jump off the dock, like feet first and try and hit the bottom of the river <laughs> and how deep it was probably at least 15 feet deep yeah because like you'd have to jump in like 
and swim a bit. Like you'd have to swim down. And I just think that at 15, uh, yeah, I didn't really have to worry yeah. <laughs> about my body. Yeah. That's, <laughs> much. That's fair. So, and, and then my other, my only other thought is that Safira is not the most aerodynamic shape for water hydrodynamic <laughs> one could say hydrodynamic one could say even <laughs> if you wanted to so i can't imagine that when she dives because it says she was skimming the surface mm-hmm. and then folded her wings to dive which means she's going in on an angle yeah probably a pretty shallow angle she can't too, right? go that far yeah because she's not you know like a gannet or something yeah <laughs> Like, she's not made to dive into the water. I mean, she does enter the water like a lance, <laughs> according to Aragon. Yeah. But. I don't know. It just, because it also says that, like, the the water impact was almost enough to tear him off Safira. So, like, clearly, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like they could go that deep, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine they were particularly deep. But. Maybe they were. Oh, yeah. Who knows? I don't know. (laughs) Maybe Aragon doesn't have eardrums anymore. Mm. That's too bad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. A bummer for him. A bummer for Aragon. (laughs) That's okay. Safira can listen to things with her ears and then Aragon can hear them through her brain. Yeah. It's fine. (laughs) Yeah. It's fine. I looked up how crocodiles stay... Because, like, Safira isn't buoyant. Uh huh. Right? Like, uh, no. so. <laughs> I would assume no. Because she, like, goes into the water and then she has to swim to get back up. Yeah. Which is not the norm for reptiles. Are reptiles usually buoyant? They, they usually, right? Like, I don't know. Unless they <laughs> actively swim down, mm-hmm. they pop to the surface because they're holding air in their lungs to, like, right, yes. breathe. Because they breathe air. <laughs> because they breathe air. <laughs> Like, marine iguanas have to hold on to rocks yeah. while they're feeding, or else they just, like, whoop, pop right up. <laughs> it's like me so. when I was cleaning at the aquarium yeah. that we all used to work at. Gotta exactly. wrap yourself around the decor and scrub with one hand and hope that you stay scrub there. <laughs> forever. <laughs> just or for put infinity. On a lot of I've Lay already out. put on a lot of weight. Uh, I think that was part of the problem. It made me very buoyant. <laughs> So I, I looked up, like, how crocodiles and alligators do it. Mm-hmm. They, like, have muscles that move their lungs around in their body. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, so they, like, they compress the lungs either more forward or backwards in their body to either dive down or, di- like, go up. Oh, is that why you sometimes see those videos of, like, a crocodile, like, floating vertically? Yeah, it, that, those are so funny. <laughs> yeah, so that's how they can move without swimming. Oh, yeah, they like angle their body up or down to like go back up towards the surface or go down, and that's wild. That's so cool. Probably not applicable to Sphera, but a cool thing I learned. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how autonomous underwater vehicles AUVs work, like gliders. Oh, cool. Yeah, they have like these tiny little motors. But they don't usually use the motors. The way they move is by alternating the buoyancy and kind of like zigzagging up and down through the water column. So it's the same thing. I wonder if the alligators know that humans stole their technology. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody has to tell them. Someone has to tell them. I don't want it to be me. They have big teeth. It feels a little bit like, I guess I was about to say, it feels a little bit like Sephira, like dragons swim. It does. Yes. (laughs) Like, it feels sort of like they do it on purpose. Yeah. (laughs) And then I was like, I was like, for like a biological reason. And I was like, well, humans do too. Yeah. So. it's fun. (laughs) So I guess dragons could do it just for fun. Yeah. I mean, they are sentient, right? So like they are fully capable of doing things for no biological purpose. Yeah. That's just less fun for us. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Aragon does mention in like a single line that is not elaborated upon that at one point he feels like he's riding a sea serpent of legend it was like uh, yeah that's the second <laughs> time sea serpents have been mentioned <laughs> okay can we 
elaborate on that a little? Tell us more about the sea the serpents. Are, are they just like aquatic dragons? Like fully aquatic dragons? Or even semi-aquatic yeah. dragons? Right? A mystery. Yeah. Tell me more, but also... <laughs> Tell me more! He won't. The other very important part about this section mm-hmm. is that Safira grins. Yeah. <laughs> Can Safira grin? I, I guess so. It's like, like toothless. And aw. I'm trying to dragon. He smiles. He yeah. does smile. It's just so weird that it's just like she grins wolfishly and it's like yeah. I didn't think they could do that. <laughs> I mean maybe it it's intended in the same way that like a dog or a wolf you would describe as grinning but it's just that their lips kind of curl up at the back so humans interpret it as a smile like maybe her mouth is just shaped yeah. like that it implies that she has like lips it does <laughs> <laughs> which is like That's a weird really unsettling <laughs> thing for like a mobile lips too Ugh. which is a weird thing for a reptile to have <laughs> yeah because they don't really do that. <laughs> Maybe it's like, uh, is it those geckos? That like, if you look at them head on, they look oh, like yeah. they have the cutest little cartoon smiles. Maybe she oh, just yeah. has a that face that's geckos, constructed right? like that. Yeah, I think that's the yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Maybe she just opens her mouth. And yeah. That's what a grin is. <laughs> she doesn't, want she's not imagine. like snarling. Her mouth is just yeah. open. I don't want to imagine. Maybe she's smizing. Maybe with her eyes. She yeah. grinned wolfishly, but with her but with eyes. With her eyes. <laughs> I hate. <that. laughs> uh, I mean, my anyway. My favorite thing about about this scene is just that like Aragon and Safira act like kids, which I think yeah. is the first time that they've done that. Yeah. I mean, a- apart from like. I guess the first time they've done that in a positive way because they bicker like children all the time. But it's like they just go and hang out and have fun together and do something goofy because they're friends and they want to. Yeah. Surprising nobody. I like that. (laughs) Yeah, this is the scene I was talking about earlier. Yeah, I like that they're bonding and like having a fun time and like kind of joking around and playing together. Yeah. It's a good scene. I know sometimes I almost wish Brahm wasn't there. Yeah. So it could just be like Aragon and Safira fi- figuring everything out themselves, you know? Yeah, I'm being best friends. I'm sure that it, that will never happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely probably not soon. No, I'm sure not. The death that's yeah. coming soon is uh not related to anything. Oh my god. Not related at all. <laughs> Predicted in the previous chapter. Yeah, by Angela. <laughs> oh, I I already forgot. Yeah. In case anyone else has forgotten. Aragon is going to suffer a loss very soon, according yeah. to Angela. It's probably going to be Safira. It's probably going to be Safira. Can you imagine? <laughs> you imagine <laughs> She's like, ah, the dragon died. The dragon died. <laughs> chapter, like halfway through the book. <laughs> like, ah, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> it's like, well, back to Carvajal. The the second half of the book is just them backtracking. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, we went. Time to go home. We went to dare it again. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a good thing that Brahm is there because the closer they get to Drasleona, the more people they encounter on the road. And Safira can't travel with them anymore because she is a f***ing dragon. So she has to hide during the day and then catch up to wherever they are at night. Yeah. Which is honestly just kind of depressing. <laughs> yeah. Also just played fast and loose with how fast Safira can fly, honestly. <laughs> she is so That's fast. It, yeah. So fast, but also no faster than a horse. No. Yeah, I was um, upset at this chapter because it promised me a mire. Yes. And then there was no mire. It was a metaphorical mire, not a literal mire. It was a mire. metaphorical mire, and honestly, that's so offensive <laughs> because mires are wonderful places. <laughs> Sophie, our resident swamp witch, upset yeah. that there was no swamp. <laughs> Actually... This wouldn't th- swamps are very different. Oh, my mistake. Yeah, there's a I there's a difference between did you know there's actual differences between you probably know this. There's a difference between a bog, a fen, a marsh, and a swamp. Those are all distinct things. And which one of those is a, is a mire? Actually, they're all mires. Oh my god. <laughs> except 
Yeah, it's confusing because it says there are four types of mires. The bog, which is acidic and has low nutrients. Okay. The fen, which can be acidic, neutral, or alkaline and can have high or poor nutrients. <laughs> what? <laughs> but it does have to be on a slope. Oh. And then a marsh where the vegetation has to be rooted in mineral soil. As opposed Obviously. to what kind of soil? <laughs> What's the other option? I don't know. Non-mineral soil, I guess. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, a swamp has like a forest canopy. Oh. So is a mire just a wetland then? Sort of, but it has to be able to form peat. Oh. Like a mire and a peat land are sort of the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Also, apparently one, like, you can have a quagmire. Uh huh. Which is a Pokemon. And, which is a Pokemon, but it's there not. are <laughs> types. There are types of quagmires that are called a quaking mire or a quivering bog. Oh my god! Uh, oh, which is so fun. <laughs> What's I want to go? Bog? That's a place in that's, a fantasy. Yeah, that's novel. a place in a D and D. The, the quivering bog. <laughs> Do they just vibrate? Like what is like, that? Why? What is that? Yeah. I don't even know. It's like the the listen. The description of them is so dense in explanation okay. that I can't even parse it. <laughs> I haven't even tried. So, <laughs> like, if you want a floating quaking mire, being in a stage of hydroseer or hydrarch succession, uh, resulting in pond filling yields underfoot. Um. Okay. Obviously, <laughs> an ombrotrophic type of quagmire is a quivering bug. Oh, well, why didn't you just say so? I know what that <laughs> yeah, means. I <laughs> if they're minerotrophic, uh, they're called quag fens. Quag fen? <laughs> That's a Pokemon name if I ever heard one. That's a Pokemon. Anyway, so none of that helped, but uh, there should have been peatland okay. here for this to be a mire, basically. I mean, maybe there is, and they just didn't talk about it. They are on, like, the bank of a very large lake. It took them days true. to get to Drasleona, which is only halfway down the lake. This is true. They did. I'm. It's. It's that the city's gross, though. It That's is. What yes. Saying. They're <laughs> like, yes. Myers are gross, and this city is gross. So it's a mire. So I'm assuming you took that personally. <laughs> I take that as a personal offense. <laughs> Myers are perfectly lovely, <laughs> unlike Drasleona, which is yeah. Yeah, just, like, imagine Terrible. a gross fantasy city with, like, overcrowding yeah. and creepy houses and, like, a bunch of dirty children roaming the streets and there's probably a dog barking in the background. Like, that's what Drasleona is like. Yeah. Mm. It says that, like, the houses are built over the streets. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, huh? <laughs> that seems dangerous. I can't tell if it means that the streets are <laughs> purpose-built tunnels or if it means that all of the houses are constructed shoddily and leaning towards each other. Yeah, I sort of saw it as, like, the second floor extends out ah. above the street. Yeah. Which makes sense. Because I couldn't imagine how they would stay upright without, like, supports in the middle of the street. I imagined that two houses build out and then just lean on each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as you, you do. Know. <laughs> as you do. <laughs> I mean, listen, it's a more efficient use of space. Yeah, they're working on their point. urban planning, and I'm <laughs> explicitly ignoring the line in this book that said that Dressleona is very clearly not planned. <laughs> they, plan <laughs> they planned it like that. It's on purpose. <laughs> it's on purpose. They're promoting high density housing in order to reduce the environmental footprint and impact of their city. Yeah, I mean, they said that all the houses are very skinny and very tall. Yeah, which. To me, says they're building the first skyscrapers. Ooh. They're getting there. They're trying to uh, imitate Hellgrind. Although I guess they oh, explicitly imitated Hellgrind with their uh, gigantic cathedral that they built in the shape of Hellgrind. And also, okay, can I read the <laughs> description of what Hellgrind looks like? Because it is buck wild. It says Hellgrind yeah. is... A mountain of bare rocks speared the sky with spires and columns, a tenebrous nightmare ship. Near vertical yeah. sides rose out of the ground like jagged pieces of the Earth's bone. What does a tenebrous nightmare ship mean? I don't know what that means. 
<laughs> I don't know what that means either. <laughs> like, I don't know. Because I've got, it confused me so much. Yeah. Like, I think I can, I, I can picture, I think, what I think he's trying to put across. But as soon as I try to go through that in detail, I'm like, I don't get it. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, it's like a big spooky mountain. It's just like real sharp and pointy. Cool, like I got that, but a tenebrous nightmare ship? Yeah. Like, what the hell? Like, why a boat? Why a bo- like does it have I guess maybe it's very triangular, so it looks like sails? Or maybe like, it has it mean masts? The peaks the peaks are like legit just spikes. I that I think so. That's weird. It is weird. That would look like a mast, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote down that specific portion yeah i just wrote a tenebrous nightmare ship question mark question mark question mark (laughs) yeah i read that and i was like what (laughs) i had to go back and try to figure out like do they mean ship like a boat or is like is there an alternate meaning of ship here that i'm not getting because for some reason that anyway it's a lot like the next part where it says near vertical sides rose out of the ground like a jagged piece of the earth's bone. Like that I can picture. Yeah. Like that I can get. You know, but I'm like earth bones. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah. it's like a big shattered bone. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. But a tenebr how can you make a mountain look like a tenebrous nightmare <laughs> ship? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. For some reason, I read that part. And just, like, it made me feel like it was a line out of the Jabberwocky poem. Oh. I don't know if you've heard the Jabberwocky poem. No. By Lewis Carroll. But, like, the first couple lines are, "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves <laughs> did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, <laughs> and the momraths outgrabe." <laughs> Like, like none of those are real words, and that's what <laughs> this section made me think. It does fit that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, basically, I think Hellgrind is a volcanic neck. Mm. Oh, which is like the formation of rock that's left behind after a volcanic mountain goes dormant, and the mountain erodes from around the like magma chamber. So all of the magma oh. cools into like a really hard igneous rock, like granite or something. And then whatever was around it erodes away because that tends to be softer. Igneous rocks tend to be pretty hard. And then you end up with these like crazy, very like geometric mountains with very steep sides. Cool. So that's yeah, probably what this is. Yeah, I guess I'm looking at some pictures of them. None of them especially look like a nightmare ship. <laughs> no. But there are, you know, some with some spiky protuberances. Yeah, like, most of them are pretty, like, I don't know, round looking. <laughs> but, like, some of yeah. them are kind of spiky. I mean, this they do say in this chapter that there are four peaks of Hellgrind. So maybe yeah. there were, like, four... Ooh, I'm losing my geology terminology. Like four <gasps> volcano holes. <laughs> yep. Those you know, are the ones. shafts, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, which would make it not just like flat on top. Yeah, these do kind of look like rock is shooting out of the earth. Yeah. You know, so they could surely be spiky. Yeah, there's a picture of one in uh, Google Images and like black and white from like an old magazine or whatever that like makes it look kind of spooky. Yeah. So maybe it's like that one. Yeah, maybe like the kind of rock that it turned into is a dark spooky one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I mean, igneous rocks can be pretty dark, right? Isn't granite and yeah. igneous and granite can be real dark? Sure. I keep saying that, watch. Granite is probably like a sedimentary rock, and I'm just like, not. <laughs> I just don't know shit. <laughs> Metamorphic. You just didn't know it. Yeah. And they like worship this rock. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. In like real gross and creepy ways. And, and did anyone else get the Wolf and the Woodsman vibes? Yep. Oh, I, yeah. I kind of went yeah. Viking Norse. Because I recently just watched the Viking show on Netflix, and I was just like, what? Yeah. Do they 
chop off parts of their body? No, that's the thing that I was like, <laughs> they don't go to that extreme. <laughs> okay. But there is a lot of just, like, human sacrifice. Mm. Right. In the Norse mythology, or not Norse mythology, sorry, the Norse religion. And there was, like, one scene in particular in the, like, latest Vikings Valhalla series, and I was just like, oh! Okay. Dang. <laughs> yeah, they, like, cut off body parts yeah and sacrifice people mm-hmm. to hell grind to yeah. to the rock to do something for some reason for some reason because they think <laughs> that reason. uh the less of a body you have the less attached you are to the mortal world which yeah. is not the worst logic but it's still gross <laughs> and creepy still kind of wild yeah yeah in like pre advanced medical techniques, yeah, times, <laughs> yeah, it's like you're gonna get sepsis, my dude. <laughs> also, just like there's no other religion, yeah, there hasn't been one mentioned. There isn't an overarching religion, no, that's a good like point, it yeah. doesn't appear that Aragon has ever been exposed to one in Carvajal, yeah. And so, like, it's kind of, like it's kind of weird that Brahm is like, "Oh yes, they have a cruel religion here," and it's like, com- compared to what? <laughs> like, like, I mean, it would kind of make more sense if it was like, "Oh yeah, they do this thing where they worship the mountain," and Aragon would be like, "What? Why would someone do that?" Yeah, <laughs> it's like, well, I have to explain organized religion to you now, Aragon. <laughs> Like, there's been no mention of one before now. <laughs> That's true. I wonder if Aragon is taking it in stride because people in Carvajal are very superstitious, which is just, like, a step oh, yeah. back from religion. I'm gonna get excommunicated. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> people being very afraid of the spine and the mysterious things that happen to the spine, or in the spine, to the point of, like, never going there is not that far removed from these people think this mountain is like mystical and mysterious and do rituals because of it yeah yeah and there's also been mention of like afterworld and stuff right that's true that's often so like yeah they have some concept but there's never been an explicit mention of like deities i don't think yeah yeah because they have this like they had that death ritual yeah yeah for hero oh yeah exactly like for Meh. Yeah. <laughs> for what? For what? For, for whom? What? For whom? St- <laughs> yeah. For whom? Who is the ritual for? <laughs> like it's just kind of strange that there isn't a religion, or there is. I guess like you know, there's magic. Yeah. So you don't really have to be like, I'm going to pray for this to happen. It's like I'm gonna find a magic person to do it for me. <laughs> yeah. But on the same token, if there is magic that almost, you could view that as like supporting like, well, there are mysterious things that I don't understand. Therefore, there must also be a god of some kind that does mysterious things that I don't understand. Like, it's not that much of a leap to go from magic to miracles to religion. Yeah. Are we just supposed to assume they're like monotheists because Christianity? (sighs) Probably. (laughs) <laughs> that's probably it like it's probably gonna come up in like the next chapter yeah and it's just gonna be like oh well this is heresy <laughs> it's yeah like, against oh. who <laughs> against who and what i wonder if there was some kind of like folk religions in allegasia allegasia F- me i keep forgetting how to pronounce that in <laughs> the land and then galbatorix stomped those out that's also what I was thinking. But then yeah. why leave Hellgrind? Because it's creepy yeah. as hell. <laughs> yeah, being like, yeah, it kills people, sure. Yeah. Galbatorx probably that. has something to do with the Hellgrind religion. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's probably also gross and creepy. Probably. It's kind of the vibe I get from him. Yeah. It was just strange because it's like, yeah, it's one thing to be like, it's religion in a place where we are all familiar with what a religion is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instead of being like, what's that? Yeah. People worship something? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh-huh. that was my only thought about that. <laughs> also that they just, I guess, didn't need an elaborate ruse to get into Drasleona. <laughs> yeah, no one cares. 
<laughs> like they're like there were 10 guards stationed at the gates and then it's like Aragon and Brum passed in without incident. <laughs> it's like okay, so you had like an elaborate plot to get into tier uh-huh. and then now you're just like don't worry. <laughs> like yeah, it's fine. It's fine. We're just going to go on it. Yeah, okay. I bet it's because Drasleona is such a mire that they're like, yeah, more people coming in. Who cares? Whatever. <laughs> it's gross already. It's, <laughs> it's already full of deformed beggars and sewage in the streets. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Might, as well. <laughs> Might as well have some more guys in. Uh, yeah, <laughs> why not? Also, I like that the inn they end up at is called the Golden Globe. For some reason, that yeah, <laughs> such a strange name. That's pretty funny. <laughs> gonna give out all the awards yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ah, like you're why gonna... why did he do it like i was assuming i they meant globe like the planet and i was like have they figured out the planet's round yet <laughs> <laughs> don't, know, don't know but i guess yeah. you could also just have a globe that's true which is circular. like a sphere yeah <laughs> yeah but that makes it an sense. even weirder thing to name your inn after. Like, ooh, we have a sphere of gold. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. Sounds fancy. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then Aragon gets drunk for the first time? Presumably, yeah. Uh, I, do, I do like that Paolini employs one of my favorite, I guess, writing techniques for like drunk people when they don't like go over the top with showing that this person is drunk but like it treats the drunk thinking process very seriously yeah and the line in this one is Safira accuses Aragon that he's been drinking because he like comes back to the hotel and talks to her and it says uh Aragon considered it for a moment and had to agree that she was absolutely right like that's (laughs) so good like that's so perfect (laughs) Having to think about something for a very long time and being like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did do that. Like getting home drunk and your uh, disapproving soul bonded dragon is like, oh, have you been drinking? And you have to be like, hmm, you know what? Yes, I have. <laughs> you know what? You're right. I did. You're, yeah, I did do that. <laughs> I did do that. Go figure. Yeah. This is very good. I love that. <laughs> it is funny. Can't wait to read about Aragon's hangover tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that that part was funny. It was funny. She's like, she's like, you've been drinking. And she's like, I won't envy you in the morning. And Aragon's like, no, but Brom will. <laughs> he drank twice as much as I did. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's so funny. It's so funny. And like Safira being like the disapproving, like teetotaler teenager. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate because that was me. I was the like very uptight teenager. I was like, Ugh. You were drinking like you're underage. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, I can't believe you would do something like that. And Safira, like, I can't believe you went out and got drunk on this very important evening. And Aragon's like, yeah, <laughs> this place sucks. <laughs> and Brom just like takes him to get drunk. Yep. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Was, I guess like Aragon is basically an adult in this world, but like, Brom just like has this 15 year old that he's been traveling with for five months. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> Now's the time. Yeah, but also, like, they just arrived at this, like, city where they're pretty sure these murderous Razak who want to find them are. Yeah. And the first thing they do is, like, let's go get absolutely drunk. Yep. It's like, <laughs> okay. That won't put us on uneven footing. No, like, I feel like the first night, you'd be kind of on edge. Like, what if the Razaks are you coming in? What if they had somebody, like, posted at the gate watching for people with your description? Which even, I think, was it Safira mentions that? Like, be careful. They're probably looking for you. Like, yeah, they probably are. Then wouldn't you be worried that it wasn't even someone you noticed? Yeah. And then, like, at night they'd come to murder you? Yeah, like, someone could have seen them at the gate and followed them to find out where they were going to go. Gone and told the Razak, which are stronger at night. And also would know that, like, humans tend to let their guard down when they're asleep. That's the perfect time to go and attack them. Yeah. It's just weird. Yeah. It's just strange. I'm like, Brom just missed alcohol, I guess. Yeah. Brom was just like, this place sucks. I need to go get wasted. You coming? <laughs> you get wasted. And Aragorn was like, well, let's yes. Go. <laughs> well, those were all of my thoughts on these chapters. Unless you guys had more. 
No, I'm good. I wanted to talk about swimming and hell grind, and we did. So and we did that. We did it. Yeah, <laughs> swimming and the mountain boat. <laughs> yes, mountain boats. That's my favorite band. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's guess what's happening in the next two chapters. <laughs> yeah, so the next two chapters are called "Trail of Oil" and "Worshippers of Hell Grind." Or, according to Hannah, we're shipers of hell. <laughs> Listen, that's a stupid spelling. I stand by it. <laughs> yeah. I don't care the if Americans it's correct. Americans are always wrong. They are. Yeah. <laughs> Worshippers has to have two Ps. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're going to get two really short chapters again. Because, like, yeah. they're already in Hellgrind. Or, wait, Hellgrind isn't the place. They're in... Drasleona. Drasleona. Yeah, they're in Drasleona. <laughs> okay, so it's like the trail of oil. I don't know. They're gonna have like some trail of oil that leads them to the Rizak, maybe, and then some weird interaction with the people who worship Hellgrind. Like, I feel like it's gonna be very staccato chapters, but I don't know. I could be proved wrong. Yeah, I feel like these chapters or these chapter titles rather are pretty self-explanatory. Like, yeah. they came to Drasleona following the trail of the Seether Oil, so I guess the trail is going to continue. And then the Worshippers of Hellgrind. <laughs> the Worshippers. Are, they're going to meet some of, like, gross, creepy people <laughs> who have cut off parts I'm of their assuming, bodies, right? I'm assuming that the Seether Oil leads them to the... Oh, to the Worshippers? Yeah, the temple, what do they call it? Cathedral. Oh, yeah. Cathedral. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's like one of the words for big church, a religious place. <laughs> the big one. <laughs> the big one. <laughs> How did Aragon know what a cathedral was? <laughs> oh, you know, he's very well read now. <laughs> I guess. Anyway, probably all of those things. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, this is so much easier to guess than Twilight. Yeah. You know, Twilight could have done a lot better with the chapter titles. I mean, it's better now. We did get those, like, wild ones at the beginning. That's true. And what is it? Thunder, roar, and lightning crackle or whatever it was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we were like, what's going to happen? And then it was, it was just a storm. a thunder and lightning storm. <laughs> it's like, okay. You no. made it sound so dramatic. <laughs> it's because we got better at figuring out yeah. what that... No, it's not something not literal. <laughs> yeah. Not something it's always not literal. literally yes, it's what literal. it says. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like that other, the previous one where we were like, vision of perfection. It's yeah. probably, and it's like, no, he literally had a vision of a perfect woman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's talk about what else we're reading. Let's. Shall we? I'm currently reading a bunch of stuff that I won't talk about, all of them, but <laughs> I finally read winter's orbit and i read all of it in one day right <laughs> it was so good <laughs> it's so good yeah i loved it what a good it book was amazing <laughs> it was so fun right? i already want to read it again right you, <laughs> yeah. s- you see what i was talking about <laughs> yeah and then i have started three other books oh <laughs> so yeah i started hook line and sinker a rom-com which is fun uh i started the lark and the wren which is a Mercedes Lackey book. (laughs) And then I started Daughter of the Moon Goddess, which I am very excited about because I think it came out this year and it has a beautiful cover (laughs) and a very good description of like, you know, mythology and stuff. So I'm excited. Nice. Yeah. What about you guys? I decided apparently I wanted to go on a literary fiction binge. So (laughs) not because my library books were about to expire. And so I panicked, listened to all of them. Of course not. (laughs) So I I finished the Book of Longings by Sue Monk Kidd, which is about Jesus's wife, if he had a wife. Oh. Yeah, it was really interesting, actually. As a very non-religious person, I enjoyed it. It was good. And then the other book I listened to was Infinite Country by Patricia Engel, which is about a family from Colombia who is separated. And so it's basically just kind of about their journey of finding their ways back to each other. And then I'm currently reading Winter's Orbit. And I just have to say, 
I feel personally attacked that Jaden is basically me. And that's it. <laughs> that's all. Maybe wait till you finish the book. Uh. Okay, good. Because, like, right now, I'm, I feel called out. <laughs> I'm only 70 pages in. Okay, I was like, oh. <laughs> Oh yeah, no! Not, um... What does that mean? Oh uh, no! It's important to note Sam hasn't finished the book yet. <laughs> I think just nobody be worried about Sam uh, for that comparison. Yeah, <laughs> she's fine. Oh god! <laughs> oh my god! Uh, anyway, should I go? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I go need ahead, to finish huh? reading this book now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I listened to another. Two queer people go uh, on a reality TV show and fall in love rom-com somehow. (laughs) I found, I assume, the only other one of those that exists. It was The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran, and it was delightful. I had a great time. And I also finished Record of Spaceborn Few, which is the third book in the Wayfarer series by Becky Chambers. And after I finished that, I decided I needed a break from Becky Chambers but not from sci-fi, I guess, because I'm now reading a Star Wars. Uh, I'm reading Lords of the Sith by Paul S. Kemp, which seems to be, I only started it a couple days ago, and it seems to be about Darth Vader and the Emperor versus Cham Syndulla in a fight for Ryloth. So oh. I feel like it's going to be very good, but also I, like, I've seen Rebels and you know, a new hope. So I know that neither of these characters are going to die, which kind of takes some of the tension out of it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I'm sure it'll be good. And then I've also been listening to our Midlight Book Club book for April, which is Anxious People by Frederick Backman. I'm three quarters of the way through and it's really good. It has more twists and turns than the Singapore Grand Prix circuit. It like something comes up every chapter that I'm like, what? Like, where did this come from? Like, oh my god, I need to go read this whole book again. So if you haven't started reading that one yet, you should be looking forward to it. It's a good one. Very fun. And when is this episode coming out? Near the end of April? So yeah, keep an eye on Instagram to see what we're going to be reading next in May. And with that, if you liked this chapter of Midlight Crisis, consider rating and reviewing us on Spotify or on your podcatcher of choice. You can talk to us and find fun-related content on social media. We are at Midlight Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and all chapters of the show thus far are available on our website, midlightpod.podbean.com, and on YouTube. And some good advice from Brom that we can all find useful. If you ever find yourself facing a wizard's duel, run away as fast as you can. Just run. <laughs> Fast. Okay. <laughs> Don't even try. Just run. <laughs> Advice that we can all use. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna go finish watching race cars now.